What is the nature of the new communications? Mr. McLuhan? I'm Andrew McLuhan. My father was Eric McLuhan, whose father was Marsha McLuhan. Gets a little biblical when you start saying it. Professor McLuhan, you've elected to become the philosopher of the means of communication. I uh, object to the idea of having elected myself. You don't think we're learning more things superficially? No, sir. We're just trying to fit the old things into the new form instead of asking, what is the new form going to do to all the assumptions we had before? One of the reasons I wanted to call myself the McLuhan Institute is because of the acronym TMI. My uncle was like, you know what that means, right? I'm like, yeah, I know what that means. <laughs> and that's like the whole point of this work is Marshall said that information overload yields to pattern recognition. When confronted with too much information, instead of trying to make sense of it, you look for patterns. And that's what media studies is. It's looking for patterns. It's not getting bogged down in the weeds, but taking a step back and looking at the total environment or situation. So, you know, TMI works perfectly. Marshall McLuhan is a professor of English at the University of Toronto and director of its Center for Culture and Technology. Suddenly, everybody have discovered him and he has become a storm center of extreme controversy. Daddy, are we alive or on tape? I don't use concepts. I use percepts. I seek to perceive, not to conceive what's in front of me. Today, the information level of education in the classroom is far below the level of modern home environment of electronic information. The reason that the 19th century child could take the curriculum and the uh, schoolroom of his time with some seriousness was that he knew there was a considerable relation between what was going on in the schoolroom and what was going on outside. In the 19th century, the knowledge inside the schoolroom was higher than the knowledge outside. Today it is reversed. You know, I started the McLuhan Institute because there is no McLuhan Institute, and there should be. Language, all language, all words are metaphors. It's like when we're having a conversation, I'm trying to get an idea across to you. And then if you're trying to retell that conversation to somebody else, it's going to be a little bit different as well. So if you really want to get to the bottom of things, you need to go backward. In order to make anything noticeable, you have to yank it out of its, uh, its original context. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin that each, with one consent, pursues newborn gods, though they be made and molded of things past. The new is always made up of the old, or rather what people see in the new is always the old thing, the rear view mirror. And what people see at any time, what their attention is focused upon is always the rear view mirror, never the present image or the present fact. The future of the future is the present. McLuhan used artists a lot to see what was happening culturally and technologically. And because of that, I think the logical thing for me to do with the McLuhan Institute is to enable and empower artists to look at technology and what's happening and to express it in the ways that only they can. A light doesn't have a point of view, though, does it? No, a light doesn't. It radiates in all, uh, uh, in all directions at once, giving it a spherical auditory character. This is right. the new uh, electric space. Artists are people who enjoy uh, living in the present. Actually, I've got it here, is in this book, ABC of Reading by Ezra Pound, that he said the artist is the antenna of the race, something that Marshall seized on early in his work. The artist being the person in society who is always on the very frontier in the edge of perception and awareness. I'm doing everything I can to create a space for artists to explore different ways of approaching technology and its effects and to express to the rest of us so that we might get a bit of a heads up of what's happening as well. In the early 50s, you predicted that the world was becoming a global village. We're going back into the bicameral mind, which was tribal, collective, without any individual consciousness. But it seems, Dr. McLuhan, that this, this, this tribal world is not friendly. Oh, no. Tribal people, uh, one of their main uh, kinds of sport is uh, 
sort of butchering each other. The paradox is that touch does not unite but separate. And so as people become more involved in each other, the more distance they feel the need of between themselves. In the new electric world where everybody is involved in everybody, where everybody is involved in complex processes that are going on in the total environment, the old identity cards that used to constitute private identity, the old means of finding out who am I, will not work. People uh, now have to encounter themselves in the inner world. The old methods of merely external occupation, national origin, age grouping, and so on, these will not serve any longer as means of distinguishing private identity. The main point of McLuhan work is that we're not helpless. Marsha McLuhan said many times, but famously in The Medium is the Massage in 1967, that there's no inevitability as long as there's a willingness to contemplate the situation. So we invent these technologies that have these huge effects but it doesn't have to be that way. We could make different choices, particularly different design choices. We just, whether we realize it or not, we choose not to. What I want to do here with the McLuhan Institute is to help people make good on that hope. I want to give people the tools, some tools, to be able to contemplate the situation. Most people only discover the effect of what they say when they read the answers on the examination questions. Danger is of the very element that we live in in the, in the 20th century, and extinction is the immediate possibility every hour of the day. What now briefly is this thing called media ecology? It means arranging various media to help each other so they won't cancel each other out, to buttress one medium with another. You might say, for example, that radio is a bigger help to literacy than television. Mm -hmm. But television might be a very wonderful aid to teaching languages. And so uh, you can do some things on some media that you cannot do on others. And therefore, if you watch the whole field, you can prevent this waste that comes by one canceling the other out. There's almost a crime that happens in the art world in the art establishment and in art schools, and that is that they encourage artists to find their style, as if there is one style. And then when you discover your style or your unique take, that that is how you should create art for your entire career. But it becomes irrelevant very quickly because the world moves on, yet you're still seeing things through that lens and expressing that thing. That to me is the death of art. A place like this is kind of case in point. There's a lot of stimulation and a lot of distraction. It's the kind of distraction that lets your mind wander rather than occupies you. And that's a very important thing and why this is the perfect place for exploration and expression because everything here is helping you focus rather than keeping you keyed up and distracted. And I think that's vital. The past went that away. When faced with a totally new situation, we tend to attach ourselves to the objects, to the flavor of the most recent past. Suburbia lives imaginatively in Bonanza land. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. There are detracting voices who cry out, the stars are so big, the earth is so small. Stay as you are. But can we afford to?